Would right. you like a tenuous at best link to our next game? Because um, it's RDU versus Viper. <laughs> tenuous at best. <laughs> and uh, this is a matchup I'm looking forward to for a couple reasons. Number one, it's a chance for RDU to do exactly what Fido did earlier. Get a breath of life and pick up a match win here that's desperately needed. And for Viper, his lineup just looks so cool. We saw him win yeah. earlier this week with uh, with the the Boomship and Hakar in the deck. We didn't actually see him utilize those tools, but they're meant for very specific purposes. But on the other side, I'm also a match that I'm looking forward to seeing, which is RDU has Mage in the lineup, and it's not banned away, and I've been told that Mage is played. It's possible. We could see it. I want to see the Mage, because it's such a strong deck. Why are you so excited about Mage? Because we've been seeing so much Priest, and uh, I want to see Mage. Ah. Uh. That makes more sense. It's a cool deck. Warrior Band Away from RDU. I think it makes a lot of sense uh, with some of the ways that uh, the tech choices Viper's had in the lineup here. Paladin Band Away from Viper. Um, and, you know, Priest Protected on both sides, of course. Um, so I'm curious, like, how, the, how this, you know, the third deck that's going to get played lines up in this situation. It's the Mage! Well, <laughs> you got your wish, Admirable. Woo! RDU just jamming out the Highlander Mage, or I guess the Reno Mage, the one acceptable Reno deck since it actually features the card Reno. The man himself in hand. Yep. Viper, meanwhile, uh, a copy of Stormwind Knight. Yeah, I was. I nearly like made this reference while we were talking about several of the Priest games. It's just like, yeah, I mean, how, how do you come back from behind when you're forced off board? Well, Viper has the answer to that. You draw a Stormwind Knight and you just OTK your opponent from hand. So the potential on that is a buff, and then another buff, and then two Divines. So it'd be nine into 18. Yeah, you can 36 from hand with Topsy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Viper just finds ways. I don't know how he does it, but he he just cooks up something different. It's weird because this like this really so was like the rank twenty reflect. deck for a while, right? Like that there, there was always just a casual group of priest players that was just like, whoa, divine spirit identifier is insane, and it didn't really have an impact on like the competitive meta game for quite some time until it did. But even after it did, it was still based around like high quality minions and gaining board or whatever else. The Stormwind Knight OTK has never really been like an ever present factor. There's been little mm. pockets of people who ran it here and there amongst other Divine Spirit in a fire metas. Yeah. But again, it's just Viper just having this unique take on things and doing things a little bit different. I, I would say the last time I saw this card actually like attempted to be utilized by high level players was when Emperor Thorson was still in standard. Because you would cheapen the Storm and Knight plus all the buffs, mm -hmm. and that's how that's how you would deliver your lethal. Since then, was that Velen's chosen days? Was that part of the combo? No, it's just it was rip through the deck by drawing lots of cards and then hope that you could cheapen all of them with Emperor Thor's on and then kill them. Right, same. Why is, am I, is it even the right card? Is Velen's chosen the plus two plus four? Buff? That's the right card. Yeah. yeah okay. Viper bolsters up Light Warden, and RDU has an opportunity. You're looking that at that Doomsayer, but you're away. thinking about the cards on the other side. Topsy-Turvy, Silence. Yep. And if Topsy-Turvy or Silence comes down with a Beaming Sidekick, Power Shield, Extra Arms, suddenly that Frostbolt in your hand is looking a lot less attractive. <laughs> thinking about Wild Pyro, Spell, and Circle. Hmm. Now we're digging deep. It's another way to kill it. It is. Well, not wrong. I think with Frostbolt in hand, that's a risk I'm willing to take. I think because you have the Frostbolt in hand, you use the Frostbolt. Interesting. I like it. I just don't see, like, Doomsayer with this hand isn't buying you anything for the follow-up turn anyway. And like I said, you play Doomsayer, it's a zero mana card that deals with your Doomsayer most of the time, Silence or Topsy-Turvy. And then alongside that, there's just all the mana in the world for Viper to go extra arms on my Light Warden. Then what? And then your Frostbolt does essentially nothing. It stalls a turn until you get to Reno, but at that point you're hoping. You don't want to be hoping, you want to be in control. Makes sense to me. Life is hey. As it stands, the draw from Viper being that silence does shine the light on RDU's play, gets rewarded for it. Or 
Freya Frost is crazy draw in that position. Now are you just trusting his deck to give him something to do on the following turn? Yeah, he's he's gonna run into some bad news here. High Priest Ahmed does a pretty good job at stopping what Reno wants to do. <laughs> yes. Strangely important to Ooh. note that RDU does not contain a Mossy Harbor in the deck. It's a card that has been teched into Reno Mage yep. as a deliberate counter uh, to High Priest Ahmet. Since High Priest Ahmet is how you fight the Reno, Mossy Harbor is how you fight the High Priest Ahmet. I see Excellent. A dark future. Viper doesn't have to fear that, ever. Also annoying for RDU to have his puzzle box in his hand right now because it means that that... Uh, Tortolan is not just an emergency button he can pull early in the game and try and get that puzzle box out. Yep. And for the rest of the game, RDU is going to be fearing what Viper can do. Quickly. Thinking Polymorph's a good draw, Ooh. Voodoo Doll's a good draw. Take a Twilight Drake, or just a thing Ooh. to play. Zephyr Shadow Were Pain. Put me in, coach. Your wish is my Just going for Edwin, maybe? No. Oh! oh! <laughs> I just had Doomsayer blindness. That minion was dead because it was silenced. That is so much better than a Shadow Word Pain. I'm annoyed I didn't see it. Galaxy Brain. That, that was sick. <laughs> I'm just Admirable has just been locked in full pog champ since that play that was is made. So good. I have literal nerd chills. <laughs> Look. He, Act, he does can verify. He actual does. goose he bumbles. Does. He does. That was sick. Whew. I just forgot the zero seven was a thing. Ooh. Bonus match indeed. Woo! Yeah. Let's go. That is a problem for Viper. There's just a 7-5 now. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. Coin Reno. See you next game. Bravo. Yep. Bravo. Yep. That'll do it. That's just good Hearthstone. Keeps it interesting, I guess. Murder! Viper is not aware that he's about to take 11 more next turn. Thinking Viper's going to need a pair of Tolvirs coming up, which means he's going to need a circle of healing, and he's, <laughs> he's going to need more as well. I guess the cleric probably dies here if you want to be responsible about it. Yeah, why not? I mean, yep. what's Viper going to do? Taking the bigger hit on the Doomsayer minion was ever worthwhile. Like digging super deep into the future here, just because that's kind of the minion you might want to die. Is Tortolan Pilgrim into Conjurer's Calling is something that might come up soon, just based on what you have in your hand and that being one of your on curve plays. Like what you have left, Conjurer's Calling is about as effective it. as you can get. You'd much rather your board was Reno Tortolan Pilgrim than Doomsayer Tortolan Pilgrim when you make that happen. In the light's name. Super nitpicky. Not even any in any way convinced what I just said made any sense. He's gonna get offered Puzzle Box a pretty extreme amount of time. It's not Polymorph out of the equation. You're gonna get offered Arcade Intellect, Lunas, or Power Creation. Literally one of those cards every time, I think. 
Really? You're gonna get, yeah, there's five spells left in the deck. Okay. With the polymorph draw, that is. By the way, that window's Ooh. closing fast. Yeah. I the mean, Doomsayer has not missed it. I mean, like to play with yeah. fire? the inner fire ended the game, let's be real. You friend. I respect the attempt. It got seven stepped more. I'll tell you what, though, the deck's doing a heck of a job of trying to get Viper back into it. <laughs> All right, it gave up. Are you happy? That's a setup for next turn. Uh, ah, yeah. you're right, you're right, you're right. Here a scoundrel, yeah. oblige us with two damage. Mystery choice, oblige us with two damage. Uh, see, I don't want to, because I want to see the Norshire Cleric draw into the bump, draw three cards, <laughs> pop off, somehow Viper gets back into it. Well, Yeah, how right. about a 2-6 tour? Okay. I tried my hardest. You have best. Well Party played. You. Game one. Well played. <laughs> I didn't know Zephyrus was that smart. <laughs> I didn't know RDU was that smart. I, I didn't know anybody was that smart. Teddy, I've never seen that happen. I honestly have not either. It's again, and it's just something that shows reps of practice because that was not a theory from RDU. That was not something that he was like, oh, maybe I get in a fire here. He'd seen that before. He knew what he was doing that turn. Turn started, sweep, Ray of Frost, Zephyrus. Thanks, there's the inner fire I was expecting the whole time. Because I've been in this position before where I have a silenced Doomsayer on the board and then my opponent plays Armet into it and I draw Zephyrus. Yeah. But, like, that's what it looked like to me. It looked like he knew. He looked like he'd been through that rep before in that matchup. It clearly was the case because Artie's taken his time on turns. Yeah. Except for when he knows exactly what to do. He's yeah. like, I've been here before. I've done this. I know this is the thing. It was fantastic. It was, it was beautiful. So much better than a Shadow Word Pain. <sighs> Bonus match delivering indeed. We got to go to our final break uh, here for Europe, but when we come back, the conclusion to RDU taking on Viper in this one. RDU desperately needs a win, and Viper, he's pretty much in that hunt himself as well. Stay tuned. Legends say powerful treasures are hidden everywhere here in Aldoom. If we hope to defeat Rafam, we'll need as many as we can get. He's already unleashed the ancient Plague Lords and countless monsters. Keep them distracted, Reno. Not a problem. This plan is totally going to work. Make that right, Finley. Oh, yes. I, I have them right, Red <laughs> There is an artifact here. The name is... Hmm. The Scales of Justice. Oh, it must be really fancy! <laughs> Only to be used in a time of great peril. <laughs> yes, I think this qualifies. Hey, look, Finley! You've lured one of the Plague Lords! Take this, fiend! Ah. Hit in the face! Yeah! Hey, guys! Get that treasure! We've got a Plague Lord to destroy! <laughs> get these, hurry! Not to worry, Finley! We just push this thing right here. No, that's a trap. Watch out! It's all good. I am totally tired. Oh. Gracious me! <laughs> what we actually need to do is press this. And there. Finley? All we have to do is hold a rope. Mm -hmm. Here 
here we go, blaming the tall, ruggedly handsome guy again. My name is Paul Nemeth, aka Zelay. And you can find me on Twitter at ZelayHS, and more importantly, my stream, twitch.tv slash ZelayHS. Tune in, twitch.tv slash ZelayHS. A day in my life, I wake up when I feel like it, then I go to the gym when I feel like it, after that I stream when I feel like it, and then after that, I try and do something productive, and it doesn't always work. My personal goals for this year, I, I prefer to make short-term goals. Uh, so I try to live each day as best I can and make good decisions in the moment. And I don't focus too much on long-term goals because that can be complicated. <laughs> and I think it's good to keep things simple and focus on what's important in the here and now. You know, it would be pretty cool if I could be first place in the Grandmaster system, but to be completely honest, I don't expect that. Just saying it's a little bigger than me. Yeah, second place, that seems like a realistic goal. For, I could probably finish second place in the Grandmasters program. Then I feel like a second place is, it's a nice, comfortable spot for me. I'm into second place. Stone Grandmasters Sensational Sunday. It's our bonus match, our sixth match of the day before we head over to the Americas region. I'm Nathan, that's Admirable Zamora, joined by Simon Saddle Welch. And right now, RDU is off to a 1 0 lead against Viper with a spectacularly flashy mage game number one. Spotting the inner fire on the Doomsayer, a play I have not made since late 2013. Wait, really? Yeah, I just incidentally got one of my things silenced while I was playing Divine Spirit Inner Fire Priest in 2013. Cool. Yeah. Great story. Really not enjoyed really. it. Not really. No, not especially now. Much worse story than the it. one that we just saw. Oh, yeah. Because well, he knew. That's the part that impresses me. He knew. Yeah, if, I didn't. If someone could work that out in like night in 75 seconds or whatever, and at the end they're like, oh, wow, I can get in a fire here, and then they play it. But it's just... To me, it's impressive that he's been through the reps, that he just knew that possibility immediately, and he just snapped it, ended the game on the spot. Roll somewhat reversed, RDU on Quest Shaman. Viper gonna be on the Priest. Why did I say rolls reversed? What, what am I talking about? Unclear. I guess because the inner fire, I just assumed RDU was the priest deck <laughs> for that game. Yeah, well, he kind of was. <laughs> That's what Priest wants to do, right? They want like a 7-7 seven, seven or an 8-8 eight, eight on the board by turn 4. That's what RDU had. Tech choice for RDU this week uh, was Hungry Crab in the Quest Shaman deck. Largely takes into account the mirror match where uh, Sludge Slurper is you know, very often one of the early tempo plays. Yep. You try to seize that away with Hungry Crab and then snowball from there. Yeah, definitely a very, very big deal. This cleric is a problem. Like yeah. Most clerics end up being. We went through this uh, a couple times today, though. We've seen that uh, oh, favoring the evil cable rat has been the play. Yep. Fully agree. Ooh. If you weren't with us earlier, reasoning for this is just mana allocation. You want this lackey in your hand so that you're able to weaponize wasp cleanly on four. Um, I think we even called this out specifically the last time we talked about this was with a Mogu Flesh Shaper in hand. If you roll Faceless Lackey, then that's really, really helpful for you to get like a big power spike in a later turn if you draw Mutate. Priest plays hard for board. Doesn't come back well from board. Find a way to swing the board. Yeah, find a way to play an 8 drop for 1 or 2 mana. That seems to work. You know, just make a 7-7 seven, seven out of nowhere like he did last game. Perhaps some foreshadowing. That's interesting. Does that help you stick a minion in play? 
Well, you don't need to, right? But do you want to? <laughs> Ooh, okay. Little surprised by that coming down. I think it's because it offers potential for something big to happen. Okay. So RDU is just on the Wasp plan, not necessarily all in on the Mogu plan. Because with the board that he had, right, even if the Cable Rat goes down, he has the cheat with Faceless Lackey, right? Faceless Lackey for one, and then his Flesh Shaper was still playable, I think, just with those two minions on board, the Cleric and the, the Tolvit. Yeah, well... I think. So Viper here, how does he end up trading, I guess, is my question. Like, do you pick off the, you pick off the smaller minions, and then you circle. So there's four minions left to play. Yeah. Where he goes to five minions, six minions. Yeah, there needed to be one more minion in play for this uh, Wasp Mogu to Are happen. Are you looking at doing both in the same turn? Yeah, right, and so right, I think right, that's right. what Artie's looking for. He's just, like, you're in a bad spot. Go for the Gusto. You know, if you hit your own Tolvir, or you hit, uh, like, a, a Belligerent Gnome, or you sure. hit Mailhouse Mana Storm, like, you're in a position to suddenly win the game. Sure. As it stands, he gets to put a, you know, 2-5 in the way. Wasp off the Northshire. Wasp off the Northshire. What would you call it? How would you say it? I, I, no, I, I enjoyed it. I was calling it out because okay. I liked it. It sounded nice. It sounded like me for a second. You say it in adoring fashion, but it just sounded like it was angry. I now understand how I feel. <laughs> Thank you for that. Hmm. Viper having to think about more from hand damage, how it affects the board, not overcommitting into a mind control attack that could cost him. Thinking about former champ setups. Mogu Flesh Shaper. And perhaps stripping uh, some power away from Barista Lynchin. Yeah, RDU, two former champs, zero giggling inventors in his deck, alongside that one hungry crab. We have seen uh, giggling inventors be a pretty big inflection point in the game, not necessarily because they come down and actually put in a wall that's effective. For the, for the Shaman player, but just because the Priest has to respect it in a lot of spots, and that can cause them to play into Mind Control tech in a lot of spots. All right, big turn for RDU. He gets the 6-6 six, six here. He's in business. Okay. What? Oh, my gosh. Value trades a 2 6. That is like the mega steal. The mega steal. That was the giga steal. The alpha and the omega steal. That's what we're just talking about like swords made out of really high quality <laughs> metals. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. What yeah. were you talking about? Oh, sorry, I was talking about Hearthstone. My mistake. I must consider. Oh man, I don't know. That. Like, what does Viper do? Cry? That's not going to help. Not yet, anyway. I'm talking about the Hearthstone. Emotional health is important. Okay, Admiral. Uh, so you're also talking about the Hearthstone here. Like, just. It's important. If you, to, if you need to cry, just cry. Don't well, be ashamed. There's I'm just, wrong with it. I'm trying to figure out what happens. Like, if RDU steals a 2 6, like. You know, he loses two minions. It's like a six, six. so much worse. Yeah, this 3 1 isn't there, the 3 2 isn't there, if he and steals... Viper has a 6 6, which kills the 2 Sure, six. but like, it, it's like, night and day. If he steals the Northshire Cleric, like, you know, how much leverage does he get from right. taking away card draw? Yeah, I think actually the Cleric is better than the 2 6. Like, the, the 6 6 and the 2 6 are such polar opposites of each other in terms of what they do to the board state that I think the Cleric may have been second best just for that card draw denial reason. All right, well, RDU's turn this turn. Not super hot, but... A couple of these have a target on their forehead, and I'm thinking exactly High Priest Amet, and I'm thinking exactly Northshire Cleric. 
I must ponder. That's convenient. You have four attacks that are able to deal nine and then deal three twice. Does leave that one seven hanging around looking scary, though. Not much you can do about that. I must ponder. But the real question this turn, like, I think those trades happen. The real question is 155 or 133, meaning two five fives next turn. Oh. I want the big stuff first. Oh. Oh, like Nadi, you agree. Sting like a bee. Wild that Pyro, maybe? Wild Pyro is interesting. Just Inner Fire in itself is interesting. Like, as I said, this 1 7 being left around is scary. Like, you have to get full control over pre sport. Like, it, it doesn't matter if you get in a situation like this where you, you know, you have five minions and they have one or whatever it is. If they make that one minion a 20 20, you still have to trade into it the next turn. Consider. Uh, I'm, I'm just I'm feeling so desperate if I'm in Viper spot. He always seems to find a way out of these kinds of situations where he's in very reasonable shape. I mean, I mean goodness, I think he's found another one. That that minion's really scary. Yep, it's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. The problem with just not having the inner fire immediately is that RDU can just smack into it with all his stuff, take value trades, scythe, scythe it out, and that's why I think Viper very quickly at the end of that turn realized that Ritualist that turn was a bad idea. He needs it on the following turn to be able to restore it to full health. Yeah, that's really smart because for RDU, look at how terrified he is to the prospect of like, oh, no, come on, I got the steal. I fought for the board. I won the board. Am I really still going to lose? That is as big a brick as his deck had to offer this turn, except maybe a Hungry Crab. I think the Mogu might trade in. No. Not for me. I'm pushing three face. Of it's the right way. That's the real one to think about, though. RDU is going to get a lot of good news this turn. Yep. He's not dead. No card draw. No inner fire. This has how much maximum health? <laughs> a lot. 18? It went to 7, then it went to 9, nine then it went to 11, double. then it went to 22. 22? Oh, yes, correct. So 22 max health. And if it's restored to full, there is 8, 10, 13, 16, 17 on board, plus a draw. I guess he gets to trade into some of that first, yeah, so it's actually even slightly less effective than that. Uh, Viper's still in this. Murder. Don't get it twisted. This game is not over. Doesn't impact the board. No, but it does set Viper to eight. <laughs> you have to go all face to do it. Looking at a shutter walk in hand. Inner fire would represent 28 Perplexing. coming back the other way if which, you went all face. Which means a single buff kills you. Topsy does the same thing. Oh boy. You're leaving an awful lot of One Health minions hanging around on board here as well that a Pyromancer can potentially come down and clean up. This is still super scary for RDU. No, again, huge whiff. No card draw, no inner fire, no Pyromancer. So now the most that Viper can take off this board is eight, which leaves three, six, seven, nine. 
plus three from the shutter walk is 12. Viper doesn't heal, he dies. Psychopomp, asterisk. Doesn't change anything. Oh, well, that's bad. That's not the one. And for Viper, it would, mean it would have to mean from hand damage in order for that heal to keep him alive. Slight mistake there from Viper, I think. Nope, never mind. I thought, for some reason, I thought the other two minions were flipped. I thought the Life Drinker was the 3-1 and the Wasp was the 3-3. He killed the uh, Mind Control tech, considering that card exactly Bog Slosher. If he, if, he could have wow. killed, if he could have killed the Life Drinker, that was the minion to kill, because that one kills him immediately. But he had no option to do so while taking max damage off the board. Bog Slosher off the top for RDU is going to end the game. Just, I'm, I'm stunned. I truly am. We've been seeing Priest get beaten all day. It's been losing matchups that it's supposed to win. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. I hadn't really thought about it. It hadn't occurred to me, but I think you are absolutely right. I think from RDU's perspective, we kind of saw the two things that you need in Hearthstone. You need to be a fantastic player with incredible knowledge of the game and have the ability to execute that in tight and important situations. Game one. Zephyrus, in a fire, Doomsayer, win the game. You also need to get lucky sometimes. And still in that 6-6 is a real stroke of fortune, and that's what we saw game two. Indeed it was. Indeed it was. We saw the Dino, I'm sorry, the uh, Mogu Flesh Shaper earlier turning an 8-drop into a batter head to be able to run over the rest of Priest's minions. I mean, yep. you have to capitalize on good fortune, and eventually it's going to crop up. If it's a bad matchup, make the most of it and then try to get there from there. But, you know, for RDU, this was a breath of life into it. Players that were in crucial situations and need to pick up wins, they started doing it at the end of this week, and so I'm really looking forward to the next three and how they're going to shape up. But for now, let's talk to the man himself. RDU is here for an interview. Can you hear us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Indeed, mm -hmm. I can. Congratulations on this win. You did so in quite an impressive fashion with game number one. I just didn't know Zephyrus would do that. Um, it's actually funny because it's something that occurred in practice. So like huge shout out to Casey, Bonnie, Hopper and Ties. We played that matchup like so many times. And like the first time it happened, I was like laughing so hard because I was like, is it actually going to give inner fire? And I remember like Bonnie was like, no, no way. And <laughs> Zephyrus is not smart enough. And then I was like, why not? It's, it's, it's stats. Zephyrus loves stats. Like I put him at one mana. I could have evocated the Zephyrus, but I was afraid that if I evocate it, he's going to give me something more wacky. I don't want to risk it, to be honest. I didn't want pain. I didn't want anything. I just wanted inner fire. It was it was beautiful. And I even said, like, the way you did it, I knew that you knew that was going to happen. Like, you'd seen it come up before because you were just so confident and happy while you were doing it. It's like, yeah, game over. Um, but I want to ask about Mage in general because it's not a deck that we've seen too much of in players' lineups. Um, why is it in your lineup? Like, what, what made it part of what you wanted to bring this week? It just... I don't want to give away too much, but it was like a really good pick against uh, what I expected my opponents to bring. And if I wasn't uh, misplaying, if I was, didn't miss the little against Orange, it would have been a 2-0 week because my lineup was like so good against both opponents. So I can only just be upset at myself. But um, I'm just putting all my effort in like um, my mind because I think that's like the part I lack of or with. I don't know. Just like, I need to get a better mindset about the game in general and uh, just take care of that. Well, what, do you, what do you feel like uh, has been the issue so far? I mean, we're talking years of you, you know, competing on the scene, being a veteran of all the competitive systems that we've had. You've had a lot of near misses, but you've always seemed to persevere and come back from it. You know, what's, what's still missing at this point? So is the fact that the relegation is on the line and every single time I play, I just have it in the back of my mind that I have to win because my score is so bad. But that's like the wrong mindset to approach Hearthstone. Like, you cannot guarantee you win a series even though your lineup is better and you're better prepared. That doesn't mean that you deserve anything. You just have to put in the best percentages every single time and be like a trooper. Like, make the most out of what you're given and not give up. Just play the numbers game. But once you see it a couple of times that it goes uh, the other way, even though you put a lot of effort, it's kind of discouraging. But... At the same time, if you discourage yourself, you're going to end up uh, losing one stick because you make mistakes. And then it just adds uh, more and more to the losses. And I think that's called tilt. And it's it's just 
Hearthstone is such a mental game. Like, it, it's pretty hard to play with a bad score. Every single time I'm playing a Swiss and I'm like 5-0, I feel like on top of the world. And like, I feel like I just play so much better than when I'm, let's say, 0-1 or 0-2. Whenever I started the tournament 0-1 or 0-2, the only time I won it was Insomnia. Like, Insomnia started 0-2, the worst possible record. I made out of groups on tiebreakers. And when I made it out of groups, when I saw that there is a chance I make it out of groups, I was so motivated and I felt like I gave my best Hearthstone. But at 0-1, I think I threw the series that put me at 0-2. So that's something I need to like work on my mindset. For example, Hunter Ace, I don't think he has this problem. I think Hunter Ace, whatever score he has, he's going to play for his best chances. And uh, that's something that helps him a lot. Well, I, I guess I guess to follow that up, you know, uh, you've always been a player who's talked about specifically that you do better towards the end of a metagame. Like as the decks develop and as you get a lot of reps, you tend to improve. And so now we're we're seven matches in. I'm sorry, eight matches in for you, uh, and you're at a two and six record. You have six more matches left to go, and we're getting deep into this metagame. Like how how much improvement do you think you have over these uh, last six matches? I'm pretty confident, but it also like uh, matters who you practice with. I'm not I'm not afraid of like potential changes because I have such a strong practice group and I'm very thankful that they included me even though I haven't been performing that well recently. So whenever we're practicing, I'm giving my best. So like I hope uh, I can also help and I hope uh, that uh, with the practice that we do, we just uh, end up helping each other uh, surpass any problems. So like I don't actually mind it right now if it's a fresh or if it's an old meta game. But for example, for Seoul, I had no practice group and I went into a new meta game. I was I, w as soon as I saw the lineups that people played the tournament, I was like, um, no. Playing last <laughs> 10 hours doesn't help. So, like, yeah, that's that's what happened. So, I just want to ask, you know, you're talking about your mental approach to the game. Um, so, you beating Viper here is kind of doubly important because it's a big win for you, but it also kind of drags him down towards you a little bit. Um, just in terms of how you're trying to think about the position you're in, are you paying attention to the results of, like, Swids and Viper and the other people that are towards the bottom of the league? So that's a very interesting thing. I'm paying attention, but I try to not let it affect me. Like when I, I was away out of town yesterday to just uh, chill and like relax. And when I saw that uh, Swedes beat Hunter Ace, I was like, ah, but I, I try to just forget that that happened. I try to just erase it from my mind because if I think of that, I'll play with pressure and I'll play worse. And uh, right now I'm happy with how I perform mentally. Um, I, I'm willing to, I'm, I'm, I need to see how I will perform after I start like losing. So like uh, if I can manage to not tilt. But at the same time, yeah, it's, it's the most important thing for me to not care about what other players are doing and just focus on my own matches. Because if I win even like four out of the next six matches, I, I can even make top four. So like, obviously the first objective is not relegating and I'm doing my best uh, to achieve that. But at the same time, I can still make top four. So just approach every single match individually and not care about uh, other players' games. But that's easier said than done. So I need to also do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> do as you say and as you do. RDU, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're working on the mindset and trying to get in the right uh, headspace for this because this is a tough, tough uh, region that you're in and you still got some more it work is. to do. So congratulations on your win and I'm looking forward to seeing you play next week. Well played. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I have heard a lot uh, between Americas and between Europe in this last week is players talking about their mental state and improving on it and trying to forget all the surroundings of it and focus on the game. And I think that is a lot because of the pressure that the relegation is is looming over players. When they when they pick up a losing streak, they go, oh my gosh, I could get relegated. And when that's weighing on your mind, you're just not going to play your best. Yeah, I mean, it's it's bad way of phrasing it. It's great to hear that from a player because it's something that you've really just only heard from us that, you know, these losses really do have these players start thinking about, oh, damn, now I can get relegated. But just having RDU come out after being in that position, just because just by nature, the players who are in that spot aren't winning as much, so we don't get to talk to them as much. So we don't hear that mindset coming out from those players on a regular basis. So just hearing, hearing that reinforced from RDU and saying, yeah, this is a real thing. Like, you know, this is playing on our minds and it's in part leading to some of these mistakes and errors that we're seeing in various positions yeah i think it's a, a great way to put it i hadn't really thought about it that way yeah all right so let's take a look at the schedule see what happened today we had six matches on our sensational sunday and we saw a lot of crew
crucial win, Saddle. We did, yeah. Um, just in terms of top contention, Bunny Hopper picking up a win and Yala picking up a win means that they both go to that six and two record, uh, fighting for that top spot. But then in terms of just the relegation picture, we got two feel-good wins for two guys that have had a lot of misery heaped upon them recently, and that was Fino and RDU, as both of those players were sat in bottom position going into their games. Both of them picked up a win to just bring them back up into contention. RDU's already even thinking about top four now. He's got that win under his Whoa! belt. He's moving on up. Let's go. Yeah. Positivity, RDU. Orange and Hunter Ace also picking up very impressive looking wins in their series. Had a lot of tough lines that they had to navigate, and I think they towed those lines perfectly. Hunter Ace hang on by a single point of health to secure a victory, and for Orange, navigating picture-perfect mana turns in order to find the end states of his second game against Silver Name. And so we can take a look at the standings now and see how things have shaped up. You mentioned Bunny Hopper and you mentioned Yarla, and they're the two who are neck and neck at the top of Division B. Yep, that Division B, people time after time calling it out, saying it might just be the most competitive, you know, small microcosm of Hearthstone players that we've ever seen. Europe, widely lauded as the strongest region. Division B, widely lauded as the stronger of the two divisions. Hey, Division A players, have you got something to say about that? Let us know. <laughs> We're here for it. We'll listen to you. But Bunny Hopper and Yala leading that group, I think, just goes to show the quality of the play from those two players this season. Yeah, I wouldn't look, be looking forward to being in Division A. I can tell you that <laughs> no, much. No, <laughs> no. I mean, it's pretty stacked up at the top. Hunter Ace bouncing back. Uh, he lost his 13-match regular season win streak. Uh, he bounced right back with, it, with a win today, and he still leads the pack overall. 7-1 with Kalento trailing right behind him at 6-2. Orange on their heels at 5-3. And, and so... That brings us to a close for the week, Saddle. Week four is in the books. We are going to be seeing rematches now. Yeah, we've Nothing already started. We've already started seeing them, but that's all we're going to get. It's rematches all the way down from this point onwards, and these players are now starting to build up a history, not just for themselves, but with each other. They're going to have these records of, you know, the divisions were swapped to an extent, but many of these matches have already happened on the previous season as well. So we're seeing some players build up like three and zero records against others. And suddenly, like, does that play on your mind in the way that RDU was talking about? We saw uh, Casey tweet just before the start of the day, just like, I, I, I never beat Bunny Hopper. Like, this doesn't happen. Um, you know, in practice, we're super even against each other. 50-50, he posts his stats. But when it comes to competitive play, Bunny Hopper seems to find the edge. You know, demons are... A thing that talked about a lot in this situation. Just I can't beat this guy. He's my demon. That's that kind of thing that's going to develop over the next coming weeks. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it as well. I cannot wait to see some more. But that does it for us here in Europe for week number four. Uh, week number five is starting next Friday. But for now, we got more Hearthstone. We're heading over to the Americas region right after this with Frodan and TJ. You can always stay up to date with the schedule at playhearthstone.com slash esports. All the deck lists, all the matches that have happened, and all the matches that are coming up. So for myself and for Saddle, for the production here, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.